Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight to Bethany Lutheran College to the first of our series of lectures on art this semester. We're going to do something a little different tonight, something we haven't done before, so hopefully you'll, you'll bear with us. But what, what we're inviting you to do is to join in. We'd like to treat it almost like a, like a forum, a uh, discussion forum on, on art and taste and culture and this collection. And so I will give you the, um, the intro, and then I'll introduce our panel. We have uh, some artists that are willing and interested in talking, and then we would like to hear also from you. Uh, after the discussion, we will have a reception <laughs> with um, some snacks and, and punch, and we'll get the chairs out of the way so you can have a better look at the sculpture. This sculpture is new to Bethany's campus. I know many of you may have seen the article in the newspaper, in the free press, but the, the sculpture in the gallery came to us as a gift, and the gift came from Lester E. Getsky. And I will read part of this, the label. Lester Getsky uh, was born in 1933 and died in 2014, and he was from Maple Grove, Minnesota. He was the owner of Midtown Manufacturing in Minneapolis. He was not the artist, he was a collector. He was creative and he was a student of Dunwoody Institute and so he was doing, um, he was making machine parts in his factories. And anyone who's ever met him knew that he was quite an individual. He's, he had like a pioneer spirit. Like he decided one day he would fly to India and he met some people and pretty soon he had a factory in India. And he stayed at their houses and they came and visited him. And he was just that kind of person. He was an art enthusiast and collected these objects and these were all part of a sculpture garden, the bigger ones in his home, in his yard in, in, in Minneapolis area. He was a friend of Bethany Lutheran College through his, he was, went to a, a church in our fellowship a King of Grace in Golden Valley, Minnesota. And so we met him through King of Grace. There was an article in the Maple Grove Magazine from 2010 where he's, he has these quotes. See, he was the kind of man who liked to do things, but he didn't like credit for it. If you Google him, there's very little on the internet. There's a, a kind of a weak obituary and there's an article. He wasn't really grabbing attention. He wasn't writing about himself. He wasn't a philosopher about aesthetics. And so I will give you some of his quotes. He said, when I see a good piece of art, I'm interested in the thought process behind it. That's, that's good. I look for artwork that draws you in. When I see a piece I'm interested in, I take a picture of it and think it th through where it will fit. So he's looking at it as ownership. I will buy this, I like this. Where can I put it in my collection? He also said it takes about a year to buy a piece, talking back and forth over the phone with the artist, with the studio, trying to decide, or with the dealer in the gallery. He enjoyed a personal relationship with the artists that he collected. He corresponded, he called, he visited them over the year, or two or three, as he was buying artwork. When they're in town, my house is always open to them and their house is open to me. And we have fun, he said. He was that type of man who, if he was your friend, he expected to stay in your house. <laughs> and who doesn't feel like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have to get more art into our communities, he's also quoted as saying. We have to learn how to relax. There's so much anger out there. And I think that, that's an interesting quote. This one is a little different for me, but he said, good art should distract you from your thoughts. Should distract you from your thoughts. And I, I think of that phrase more maybe as a businessman who is working through the next orders or thinking about his next endeavors as a businessman. His favorite sculpture in the collection was called The Good Book by Mark Lundeen. And it's the piece where there is an elderly woman, probably a grandmother. My relationship to that word has changed. <laughs> and the most recent acquisition is the cougar on the back wall here by S.L. York. 
Much of the sculpture in the Getsky bequest uh, came from Loveland, Colorado. There's like a school of figurative sculpture that he w really enjoyed. And so he would travel to Colorado to, to visit the artists. Another large group comes from Plentywood, Montana, which doesn't sound real. <laughs> but he enjoyed traveling to different states to meet the artists. So Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, Texas, and Idaho are some of the states whose art he has purchased. The gift to Bethany was approximately 200 works of art. I went through the collection today that isn't up. We decided to feature the large-scale public art. So this, is, this was from his garden for the most part, except for maybe some of the Western art upstairs. But he also gave us, uh, we have 85 framed prints. We have 95 unframed prints, and collectible prints signed by the artists, limited numbers. We have another possibly 50 small collectible bronze and copper sculptures, mostly with a Western theme. But we thought we'd focus on the large scale works. Right now, uh, the scholarship for authenticity and the origin of some of the uh, sculptures is not complete. We're hoping to, to figure that all out soon. And our intention is, I could say, I, I know what it is, but the president's right here, so he could say, no, it isn't. <laughs> our <int> <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. No, our intention is to graciously accept the gift, and then there's probably some restrictions, and there's probably some, the outcome of all the artwork is not certain. Um, but there are steps involved to what we decide, and we are looking for input. We have a faculty committee looking for where we might place some of the sculpture. And what we want to do tonight is talk about the sculpture, talk about Lester Getsky's bequest, um, and maybe even talk about where some of the sculpture could go. And so to help us in our discussion, I've invited three artists to join us. The first one on my left here is Eric Oren. Eric has an MFA in sculpture from the University of Iowa, and he is a teacher here at Bethany, teaching sculpture, 3D, ceramics, and art theory. Then next to, next to Eric is Jason Jasperson, Jason is a sculptor. He does public works, has public works across the Midwest, I think. Certainly in New Alm, if you've been to New Alm, you, you've seen some of his work. He also teaches at MVL, and he is working on a master's degree in experiential education. And then next to him is Susan Harstead, who is our fine arts coordinator, and she has a master's degree in art education from the University of St. Thomas. And so this is our panel, and I'm going to open it up. But I would encourage you to ask questions or add your insight to it. And I'm going to turn the mic over to them. I think we're, we're a little bit on the hot seat here because we, we didn't necessarily get together to talk about how this was going to go. So I think a lot of it will be determined by kind of the questions that you might have about uh, some of this work um, or any other kind of comments that you might have. Um, that uh, Does anybody have anything that uh, is burning to get out as far as the question goes? Mr. Overn. There weren't anything, uh, there weren't any states listed on the East Coast. I'm wondering, can, can you provide some insight into the, the sculpture market for that? And, uh, why is a certain type of work coming from a certain part of the country? Mm -hmm. I'm on it. All right. <laughs> Well, I think there's definitely a, a regional style, and and sometimes those styles seem at odds. East Coast, West Coast, United States. Um, if you if you kind of look at what we mean by Western art, or sometimes Southwestern art, um, there's a, there's a more maybe a more relaxed feel. Like Bill mentioned, that 
that Lester likes that idea that art should help you relax and distract yourself from your thoughts. I would say if you look uh, more at sculpture um, on the East Coast, say New England area, New York, um, the tendency there is to, to really dive in and confront your thoughts. To really, um, uh, there's more of an academic tradition on the East Coast too. Very strict adherence to uh, traditional anatomy, classical tradition. And uh, there's more of kind of a cowboy attitude out West. I do what I want. It's America. Good question. Do you want to talk specifically about Loveland, Colorado? I know a little bit about Loveland. Uh, there's, there's a, the sculpture that was mentioned, the, the grandmother with the children, uh, is by uh, a man whose last name is Lundeen. And that family, there's a, a several sculptors in that family. Uh, the oldest is George, and he started this kind of phenomenon, this idea that Loveland, Colorado can be an arts town, a destination. It's a small town that uh, has an annual sculpture festival, and it, it's the largest sculpture festival in the nation. They attract hundreds, 500 sculptors I heard last time when I was there, and they've all got booths, and uh, you go and it's just, there's sculpture everywhere. And what they do as a city is make a purchase. From that festival, the city makes a purchase or gives an award, uh, either to purchase the sculpture outright or to commission a new piece. And then they have a park that collects all of these sculptures. So little by little, the, the city becomes a gallery. And even when the sculpture festival isn't there, now this has been going on for decades, uh, the city is full of bronze sculptures. You drive around and you walk around and they're they're absolutely everywhere. Do we know if Lester get do we know if Lester Getsky went to that festival to find his his pieces, Bill? No. It seems like he might have. And the things that Jason was mentioning sound like what Mankato is becoming. We in Mankato here now have the annual sculpture walk with different sculptures every year. And then the people who view all the sculptures, can vote on a ballot, which their favorite is, and then Mankato will purchase that sculpture and it becomes a permanent part of the city landscape. So Mankato is becoming a town with a similar model. Well, let's talk a little bit about the art. So what do you think about Lester Getsky's choices of sculptures? So there's a different, um, a different feel on this level. These are the ones that were in his sculpture garden. And then upstairs, there are, there are a few more that were his, in his outdoor sculpture garden. And then there's quite a few of the Western pieces. You heard Bill mention that there are many, many more of a small scale in that collection. So is this the kind of taste that you have? Do you, would you choose similar sculptures to what Lester chose? I personally would not, but this is, um, I would love to hear your comment. Nice comment, yes, you're right. And the expressions on the faces of the, of the figures really draw people in. There's, um, he chose, sculptures that have a really nice nostalgic feel to them and they do they do speak to people um, they are perfect to be in a garden i think rather than in an indoor setting they're meant to be outdoors tatiana and there's the question let me pass the mic on to a okay Carrie. I'll talk a little bit and then I'll pass the mic to Jason. So when I attended Gustavus, um, I was I was a Gustavus junior and senior and 
the sculptor Paul Granlund was still alive and well and working. And so whenever he had a pouring day, any art and art history student was welcome to go into the studio and watch. And that was neat. And then in my sculpture class there, we all had to create one container, which was kind of a weird um, small scale project. And everybody came up with a different idea, but we had to do something. Mine was, um, I think it was clay. And then we had to in plaster involved. And I still have a scar on my arm from cutting these metal sprues off of off of my sculpture and it's, I've got a nice big scrape <laughs> because all of us in my class were taking these big clamps and chopping them off and throwing them into a bucket and in fact it was somebody else's sprue that I think scraped across my arm <laughs> but um, those are my memories of making a sculpture but Jason you are the man who can describe quite a bit better how it goes yeah. Yeah, I'll talk a little about this. I also spent some time in the, the Gustavus uh, foundry with Paul Granlund and, um, and poured there. Uh, uh, here's a couple things, a couple highlights that you should know when you look at a bronze sculpture. It started probably as clay, but the clay is kind of destroyed or discarded in the process. There's a series of mold making that happens uh, sometime along the way, there, there's a wax duplicate of that clay that's produced in a hollow form. So the, the best way I can describe that is like a chocolate Easter bunny. It's hollow. You bite into the ear and there's nothing on the inside. But you have that form on the outside. All of these are hollow. When you look at a bronze sculpture, the artist may never have touched the sculpture. They may have done work on it. But their work is predominantly in, in that original before the, the mold making happens. Um, if we go from the wax hollow, uh, there's another mold making process that encases that in kind of a fireproof, heat proof uh, mold. That's where the plaster was coming in. There's plaster and sand and some silica. Um, that wax gets melted out and then there's a gap in the plaster where the wax used to be. Hot metal, about uh, close to 2,000 degrees, uh, is poured out like lava into there. And those sprues that you were talking about are like tunnels or pathways that allow the hot metal to move where it needs to before it cools. So when these come out of the, when it comes out of the sand, it will have all these spoke-like things coming off of it. And there's quite a bit of work to get it to its finished form for, for you to have on display. That's right, they're ugly when, when they come out. And they might be chopped in pieces. Um, an arm that sticks out like this, or wings that, that stick out, or there are a lot of these that have long sort of flowing elements. They may have been cast separately and then welded back together and, and so there's a good deal of work here that's done at the foundry. The craftsmen at the foundry weld. Uh, it's called chasing. They're, they're cutting off the sprues, cutting off uh, flashing, these kind of fins that come through little cracks. And uh, they sandblast it, apply a patina, and a final finish. And in some of these cases, there are pretty fancy patinas. That's that girl that you never dated. <laughs> Um, a, a patina is what happens on the surface, you know, th that they're, um, you know, whatever you want it to, you can blue it or green it or make it look rusty or, you know, it's like your, it's like our old cars. It's, uh, wow. you, they have patinas. Yes, know how. How? Um, lots of chemistry, chemistry acid. Um, various things like that. The thing I was going to say is that you know this process goes back to the ancient Greeks. I mean, it's the bronze casting in, in a lost wax style has been going on for 4,000 or more years. So this, what you're seeing here, is uh, is not a new way of doing anything. Um, and we don't see a lot of the Greek, the old Greek stuff, because uh, a lot of that was lost or or uh, you know melted down and 
made into other things like weapons and you know so there are very few extant pieces of, of, of Greek um, uh, bronze work that you can actually see and the stuff that's out there is is very beautiful um, but and you know so that kind of process then got picked up again in the 17 or 1800s um, and uh, where there was a rebirth of, of any of this kind of style of things and then it sort of trickled along to what you see here um, it, it, you know where it gets there's a sentimentality that has been then added on to it for this this kind of work so any yeah Sorry, man. I, looking at these, I would expect that every single one of them has multiple copies. Um, as an artist, that's a that's a um, a wise move. Putting all the work into that that original. Um, if you have the ability to make multiples, and uh, and kind of forego the initial setup fee, it's kind of like I. I had t-shirts printed for MVL, and there's a setup fee. The more you print, the, the less it costs per piece. Um, artists will often do a limited edition run. Um, sometimes they number each piece, sometimes not. OK. And Bill's saying some of these are numbered. There might be 12 in an edition. Depends. Um, the mold does degrade some. Uh, and like. Eric was just saying that this is an ancient process, uh, but to look at it today, if you went to a foundry, it looks like a factory. There's forklifts and there's chemicals, and you know it's it's loud and dusty, um, expensive. It is expensive. Yes. Question. Yeah, the uh, if you've seen any of the the Grandland sculptures at, at Gustavus, they've been out for years. Um, I'm not sure if they do anything to treat the surface as as they go along. I mean, there might be some, you know, every few years they might get some kind of a cleaning or something. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's as the surface is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to rust. It's not going to, you know, it might get a little moldy. That's from natural stuff kind of falling on it and growing, having things grow on it. But yeah, it's very, very durable. I think with the Casota stone, you've still got natural materials that are in the stone. And so it's, um, you you know that comes into contact with the weather and and you know everything else and so it's going to create um, mosses and lichens and molds and things like that where the bronze is not is a non-living thing so it's not going to do the same thing. Uh, porosity is a issue too. Stone will take in moisture and and will kind of allow a habitat that way and bronze runs, for the most part, doesn't. We shouldn't think that it's impervious. In the back? You mentioned two different methods of flooring, one that involved wax and one that involved destructible materials. I was wondering why an artist would pick one over the other, and what can you tell by looking at these which method was used? Uh, OK, good question. Um, and it's highlighting that I wasn't completely clear. Uh, the, the wax is part of the process for each one of these. And so when, when you look at this, you have to realize it started as clay, became wax, and then became bronze in every single case. Uh, and so there's, there's two mold making processes. It has to go from clay into a mold into wax, and then the wax goes into a mold which turns into bronze. How long does it take? 
It de the safest answer, it depends. Um, well, I'm working on a project now that uh, the foundry told me give us two months for their end of it. How many piece mold is it? That's kind of their problem. Okay. How many pieces uh, is the mold is what Eric, Eric asked. Um, so you, you're sensing the disconnect because I'm the artist, I'm, I'm making the clay and I've done bronze work but on, on the project I'm working on now I'm not going to. I'm just going to turn it over talk with them a little bit and really hope it turns out. I'll, I'll check it out at the end. In the back. Uh, in regards to cleaning, you said that that would be super good. Um, on Bethany, would we do one in the can? And then if you did donate to the city, would we have that in the American can? Can't share it in the main menu? It's all 50 a little over time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what the city would do. Um, you know. That would be their responsibility. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think, I, I, we, and I'm not even sure about if the talk about the donating to the city. If that, I don't you know. That's in the infant stage, if at all. And so um, I'm not sure how that would go, so I'm, I guess we don't really have. No, I don't, it, once it isn't ours anymore, then if we do donate or give or sell, you know, then it, it becomes somebody else's responsibility. Andy. There's, there's the intrinsic value, just the cost of its creation could be thousands of thousands of dollars. So, uh, but then the artwork is inherently subjective, and the value ultimately is what someone ascribes to that thing. So, uh, for something like a boy with a baseball hat, um, he has intrinsic value because, or he sold at a loss. That's the only choice he really have. So. How does one go about fixing a price tag something like this in the hopes of a guest or somebody comes along and then wants to, wants to buy it? Some of these sculptures are by a man named Victor Issa, or Victo Issa, I-S-S-A. Uh, I believe this one is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman on the far end. Um, I. Somehow I got on his mailing list, and I get newsletters, um, and uh, he's very good at marketing. Uh, what, what he does is he presents an urgent situation. We're pre-ordering now. Get it at a discount. It isn't even made yet. It shows, it shows him kind of sculpting it in the clay, and he hasn't really set his edition. Um, so, so the answer is it's business. And, uh, and it's supply and demand. He's trying to create demand. And he's, you know, he's creating a new product, and he really hopes that his audience will like it. And, and he's, I think, very cleverly building a collector base, which it looks like it worked for Lester, you know? You don't want to talk about what happens with the I could I had, there's a notebook that came along with the works that has some bills of sale and some authenticity certificates. And so the most expensive one that we know of, for sure, is the mother and child, which had a price tag of 33000 when it was, when he purchased it. So it's, uh, I, off the top of my head, I don't, but we do have that, that bill of sale. And so... Um, some of the larger sculptures, like the one behind me, was probably close to 20,000. Um, and the other figure also was about 18,000. And now the addition is closed on that one, the woman standing here. And so we don't know, we don't know the current price. We know that he, at, at one point he paid 
20000 or $25,000, but we're not sure what it's worth right now. So it, one of our goals was actually to get an appraiser even, too, to see what is the current value. The other thing I was thinking, I was getting a student to call the studio and say, we have this Lester Geske sculpture, and what is the current market value? So, I mean, we're definitely interested. But with the three, three larger sculptures, you know, that's a considerable amount of money. Some of the smaller ones, too, the, the sale, you're going to be in the $10,000 range. So. I think, and also, you know, whether these artists are, are living or dead or, or what kind of reputation they had before they died, we do have a, a, a Frederick Remington upstairs or maybe a couple. I can't remember how many. One. Okay, but, it, you know, the question there is, is it a copy? of a Remington or is it a, a, an authentic uh, Remington? And so that's what one of the things that we need to find out. And so Frederick Remington was a, a very well-known Western uh, artist, painter, sculptor. And so the value of, of, the, of that, if it is a, an actual um, authorized Remington, will go up by a lot, even though it's you know, one of the smaller sculptures that we have. I'll talk a little bit about that same Remington. So um, Frederick Remington lived to be 48 years old and um, lived till 1909. And that piece up there called The Cowboy is dated 1909. So, and we don't really have the authentication for many of these pieces. And that's when we have to look at, you can turn the sculpture over, you can look on the backside, you can look on the underside and see if there's marks from different foundries and those are all sorts of clues that will help us figure out if this is um, an authentic Remington or if it's one of many unauthorized copies. Um, but that, that one up there for sure walked past it after, after our talk and while, while we're having the reception. So that's one with, with um, artist name recognition, that one. And then you'll see three prints on the wall here which are part of the Getsky bequest also. The first one in the black frame is by Marc Chagall, a Russian uh, artist. And the next two are, are signed by Salvador Dali. The middle one is a, is a lithograph portrait of Pablo Picasso. And the, the third one there is also a Salvador Dali, but I can't, from this angle, describe the scene. Um, Bill, can you tell us a little bit more? the Crusades. So those are kind of interesting too and those are because they are lithographs there are many many copies in existence and we're not exactly sure of how much Lester paid for them or or what the um, the current value is of those. But yeah they're Lester loved Western art and we're not be able to see in the show all of the art that that he gave um, but there's something neat about American Western art, and I know Eric likes talking about this topic too, but, uh, <laughs> but um, Western art is something that Remington didn't really live that life. He, he, he was born in 1861, so this is after the, the era of the big buffalo hunts and after the big cattle drives, and this is when the, the open prairies were getting fenced off and he was creating this art in the form of pen and ink drawings for magazines of watercolors of oil paintings and then later on in his life sculptures and it, it was he marketed it well because people loved it they loved it the, the nostalgia of the old west it's a it's a neat topic and so frederick remington himself was a new york city boy who went to yale and then he went out west a couple times for sketching he lived in Kansas City for a couple months and had a sheep farm, and then lived in New York, and he brought back some prop clothes and some cavalry hats and had his friends pose. And so he wasn't really living out west, but he's the, he's the guy that people think of as the western artist. It's a neat story. Receipts, 
and where, where and when things were purchased, that's a, a big key for authenticating things, the provenance of it, and following the, the trail of who owned it and how long, and having, having copies of when an art piece changed hands. Yes? Do you know uh, if any of them were commissioned by Ah, I do not know. And I'm looking at my friends on the panel, and we do not know that answer. I don't know. I don't think any of us do. I'll hand you the mic, Bill. Some of these pieces are part of um, the artist studio work. If you go online, you can still find, like if, they, if, if the edition isn't closed, you could still buy some of these pieces. Now, the artist who did this one with the birds is deceased, and, and they don't sell that work anymore. So then it has maybe a more rare value. But some of, the, some of these, like the good book, you can still buy. Um, this one you can buy multiple sizes. You can buy a desk size, and you can buy a half half length and a full size. And of course, there's a pricing. In a way, these are, these are production company sculpture studios, and so they'll fill your order. But I think he just liked that personal connection with the artist. So he, he would talk to that main guy, even though the main guy has many workers doing a lot of the, the harder, the stuff that scratches your arm. <laughs> It, um, there's a as with prints, you would you know say you would do ten prints of a, a certain edition, or if I don't know what you know if they did this twenty times, then once you've made twenty, then it's closed. If that's what you've agreed to, if you start opening the edition up again, then there, there's questions of authenticity and you know all the rest of that. So yeah, Kathy. Uh, is that possible because of the computer? Or it certainly is easier these days to do it, but um, it, it, all of these things for you know thousands of years have been able to be scaled without the aid of computer. Um, have you ever been out to Mount Rushmore? All, all of Mount Rushmore was done in the same technique that would have been used, you know, long before that, where you, where you, it's called pointing, where you just, it's like hanging a, a, a flat thing out in, out in front of this and then measuring off your, your point and then you drill, drill down or, you know, or you can then scale that whole thing um, so that you can get the same sculpture essentially by by changing and change the scale. So, you want to say anything? You want to say something? Oh, have you ever heard the phrase, the mold has been broken? Or like, ooh, after that, the mold was broken. Mm -hmm. That's a phrase that really refers exactly to what we're talking about, of say you've got your, your, your clay mold, and then you, you never want to make any more ever again. Crack it with a hammer, and then you have to start from scratch. I suppose, I suppose, yeah. And I also think about photography. If you have a, a negative of something, you could, you could print a million of them if you want to, but I suppose if you want a limited edition, you've got to get rid of that original negative in some way. Yeah. Andy, oh, and then. Yes. Excellent question. We're still figuring this out as we go. We've never gotten a gift of this type on our campus, and we 
Bill is about to say something. Okay, take it. He didn't actually leave money specifically for that. He did give Bethany uh, a nice gift besides the sculpture, but it wasn't designated. And I'm not sure I could convince development that that's what we could use it for. So yes, we'll, we'll need some money for maintaining the collection and for getting it appraised and for getting it all mounted, but we haven't answered that one yet. So. Yes. I think that's a very interesting topic. What, how, how will this work be, what's the relationship between the public and the work when it's outside compared to when it's in a gallery or in a museum or in a house? Inside it's more of a don't touch situation, but outside, yes, everybody's going to want to pose with it and um, maybe like climb up next to it and put, put your arm around it. <laughs> I had a sculpture professor who said, if you're going to put it out, anything out in the public, it need, you need to resist the public. One, you know, like assume people will climb on it, hang from it. Uh, and and uh, you just need to think that way. That doesn't mean people will do it. Here, I'm going to add. All right. I, I always heard it, it was, what did you, you just said? Climb? No. Um, what was the, people are what? Pe oh, pe you, need you need to resist the people. I always heard it as people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that relationship, you know, the idea that people are going to touch it and, like, over years, affect it, change it. Um, I, I think that's part of, just part of what this is going to be. You just have to be ready for that. And light it well and say your prayers. Maintenance includes cleaning and applying a wax, not unlike your car. Wash and wax. Way in the back. So, um, with the project you're selling, is there any moral dilemma with selling a gift that we received as art that he hopefully would think you may stay here and be shown at that Bethany campus? First, if we were to sell him, you know, how would that you know, feeling come across that, oh, wow, well, we just got this gift, and now we're going to take it and turn it to cash. First, if you designate all this money, you can do that. You know, I don't know if that makes sense or not. I get it. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, which I am not, in, I'm not involved. I never had the opportunity to uh, meet Lester. Dan, did you? 
Did he ever talk to you about wishes, intentions? Okay. I know Art Westfall had conversations with him about intentions and future use and things like that. So we knew this was coming someday. Um, there's a long story about a will and whether it was an authentic will and things like that. And there were some stipulations, but there was much court procedures that took place to determine if this will is really legitimate or not. And I believe it was determined that the wording of the will could not be authenticated. That's what I'm thinking I remember hearing. So there may have been some stipulations in a scratched, in some scratch notes, but um, those are not, I understand those are not um, legitimate, at least in the eyes of the court. So I think it really is up to Bethany to do the best we can to honor Lester. I can tell you that we have endowed a chair at Bethany the Getsky Chair of Engineering with some of the estate gift. We've also um, put some of the money into a Getsky Scholarship Fund for students. So we've taken large portions of, of the gift, which was you know the more the, the cash part of the gift, and have honored Lester that way. And so now what to do with prints and sculptures I think that will remain to be determined, and we've got committees working on that. They're certainly beautiful pieces, and, and we want to, you know, want to have them out where we can enjoy them. How's, how's that? I actually did meet Lester, and initially, we were supposed to keep everything. But then um, his family said, do what, do what you have to do because one person's quirky taste may not work in an institution. But initially he did say he, he wanted the whole collection to always be together. And I think at that time, I actually met him when I was with uh, Dick Weekman, and it was at, at least 10 years ago. Um, and when someone says you have to keep it all, the next, the next uh, line of conversation usually is, how would you like to sponsor a museum? because you need, we need a lot of space. This filled up our gallery, and this is only a small part of the gift. And that conversation about a museum never took place. And so I think it's at our discretion. And the other thing, you know, a question for me is that, you know, a lot of this is outside of um, what we teach here, uh, you know, or uh, what we consider at least from a sculptural point of view, it is kind of the line of, of um, you know, where is, where has, uh, you know, what are we teaching to students? And this kind of is a little off track from, from some of that. So it doesn't necessarily support um, what, what I would want a sculptor to, to, to learn. Um, and so that's, that's problematic as well. Not that you can't learn to cast bronze and do some things like that, but the, um, usually uh, I'd be thinking if you referred more to what Jason said about what's happening out on the east or west coast, it's you know, more about kind of uh, what art is able to do or say to you that is um, maybe a little more, I don't, I don't want to say a little more thoughtful, but um, certainly less sentimental than, than this work is. Um, I obviously, I have a bias there, too, so, yeah. Or do you, do you try 
try to reserve some sort of conceptual high grounds. They thought, I want to make something that's thought-provoking. I guess, how much does the expense of its creation have, uh, have to do with the content that you tend to see in this style of artwork? <laughs> Depends on how much skin you have in the game. Personally, you know, uh, because it's business. There's, you're right. There's money involved, and it's a product. We we have some some notions about what art is and what it should be, um, and and sometimes you know we we think that maybe it's it's a fantasy world, but it, but it's business, and so you're talking about trade-offs. The decisions that you make are the compromises. Yeah, of course, there's compromises, you know, and and I think every artist has to wrestle with ooh, appeal. Is it important to appeal to other people? Is it important to quote be true to myself? Um, as a Christian artist, I think you have to you have to ask the service question. How can I be of service? How can I? How can I help someone with this work? That's and that's outside the business question. Yes. In in the gallery. This I think we all three should probably weigh in on that. So first it's start, a, first yeah. it's a yes or no and then and then explain. Um, well, I have a controversial choice. We've talked about this. Uh, Bill and I have talked about this a little. The, the nude up there that's slightly green, it's kind of hiding so that nobody sees it. <laughs> uh, out of, you know, it's like the most out of sight. You can't really see it from over there and you can't really see it from here and most people don't go upstairs. Um, that to me, that, that is uh, the piece that has the most sculptural integrity. I, I trust the uh, the anatomy and take that in the most academic way. Um, I, I think the gesture is lovely, classical. Um, there's a nice twist, a uh, nice movement to it. But unfortunately, she doesn't have clothes on. And so, and so I think, you know, there's a good chance that maybe we won't see it again. I don't know that. I don't know, you know, if we'll, if we'll hide it or what will happen. But that's... And I, I say we as if it's my decision, it's not. <laughs> but that's my answer. I, I really like that piece. And I would, I would agree with, with Jason. That would, be the, that would be the piece that probably you know, supports everything that I mentioned before. Um, it, although, I mean, it's, it's still very classically based. Um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't contain, you know, some of the other things that I mentioned as far as the reliance on, on sentiment or nostalgia or things like that. I do, I do not mind the, uh, the, the rooster or the, the fox. I think there's a fish up there too that is, is nice, but the, the rest of them have other issues for me. The, uh, the big cat back there isn't too bad. <laughs> the big the cougar sitting behind your head ready to pounce isn't too bad either. <laughs> I wish that we had all quickly scribbled on a piece of paper which our favorite piece was and all held them up simultaneously because I agree with these guys too and this is my choice too. I like that she's kind of like a dancer and and she's, yeah, her, her motion is beautiful and it, if I had to choose one piece, if Bethany had to ch save one piece from this collection, that would be my choice too. Bill, do you want to weigh in on yours? Do, um, I, this might not be, um, do any of you in the audience have a particular favorite? I'm scanning across the room. If, would any of you like to weigh in on which is your favorite in this show right now? Okay.
We've had several groups um, touring the campus before the school year opened, and there were um, several groups that came through, and they all stopped at this piece and took pictures of it. So I think that this one really has spoken to audience members who've walked through the gallery. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can see five great Western pieces up, up on the upper level. Those are the best of the Western pieces. How about from this, this part of the... Yeah. She likes the mother and child, and that happens to be the one that's on the postcard for this show. And on the postcard, you see it from the back, and it was a picture taken outdoors. And yeah, you can, it's nice how it's displayed in this gallery because you can walk all the way around each piece, view it from every angle. It does have a, yeah, there's a nice feeling between the mother and child. Okay. I, I hate to cut it, it's not short. I hate to cut it, the end is here now. I'd like to thank the, our panel for sharing their wisdom with us. Thank you. I consider the conversation ongoing though, so if you want to continue talking with any of the panels, and we'll try to clear some of the chairs, but there's a reception now. We invite you all to stay and chat. Thank you. <laughs>